I never really imagined that I could be an Olympic water polo player, but I was like, love a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Here's to all of you who have picked yourself up after failure, who put your heart and soul into hard work. You judge results by your own standards. The grind is where you find your edge and through it all, finding success, especially success in the form of gold. WIS gets you and exists to help fellow go-getters just like you. WIS helps businesses win by outworking and adding more value than their competition in the tech and accounting space. That's the edge. WIS is good with numbers, epic with people. Welcome to the Just Women Sports Podcast, where we talk to the biggest athletes in the world about the untold stories behind their success. I'm Kelly O'Hara, and my guest today is Ashley Johnson. Ashley Johnson is a two-time Olympic gold medalist and a four-time Swimming World Female of the Year award winner. Her medal count across World Cup, Pan American, World Championships, and more, she has combined 14 gold medals. And now, coming out of the Tokyo Olympics, Ashley Johnson is being heralded as one of the best water polo players in the world. Ashley, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kelly. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you. Um, What an amazing introduction, especially all of the gold medals. I think you might be the most gold medal decorated athlete I've talked to. (laughs) That's like really cool for me to hear. Like it's all a reflection of our team and our team team environment because like, I mean, our model going into this Olympics was all gold, everything. Nice. And that's super cool to be a part of that, but also to know how humble our team environment is and how much hard work we put in. But all everyone sees is the gold, so it's like fun to play with that for a little bit. (laughs) That is true. And it is it is true. Everyone always sees the gold medals, the wins, the victories, but it's the journey and the you know, the life lived and the preparation beforehand, which is like what goes into it and what actually wins it for for the for the people who do. So for you, your parents are from Jamaica. Um, you're from Miami. You grew up there, you were raised by your mother, um, Donna Johnson, and you're one of four siblings who all play water polo. So can you talk a little bit about what childhood was like for you? Yeah, um, me and my other, I have five siblings actually. Okay, Four of sorry. us did play water polo though. Got it, okay. So my youngest brother is a big reason why we're like water safe and we grew up with a pool in our backyard and my mom's biggest concern going to work, she was a home care nurse. She would always think that we were all gonna fall in and drown. So she yes. called us 20 times a day, called um, just to make sure that someone picked up. And if we didn't pick up, she would rush home and she'd be like in a panic, you know? Oh. So we learned to swim. And then um, her friend recommended this swim program that happened to have water polo. So we all kind of got in around the same time, me when I was nine, and then I'm the middle, so everyone in their own time around then. But we all loved water polo, especially compared to swimming, and it just kind of stuck. It was where our friends were, it was where our family was, still is, and it just taught us lessons that we never would have gotten. I mean, if we'd gone into another sport, I believe that sport teaches you a lot of different things that carry you through life, but we just never really saw pathways to the opportunity or to the lessons that we learned through water polo. Yeah, makes sense. So did you start swimming, just like traditional swimming first and then get into water polo? It's actually kind of cool because the swim program that we got into, like part of the swim program, you pay two for the price of one. If you pay for swimming, you also get water polo. So we would just stay in for the water polo practice after swim practice. And then it became that we had to swim if we wanted to play water polo because Uh, like it was the reward, you know, you could play, you could splash, you were fighting. It was just like some more horseplay that me and my siblings did anyway. So it was, it was really cool. Yeah. That that program worked. So did you, were you the first one to actually get into water polo or was it, you kind of said it was, you guys all kind of did at the same time. Yeah, we all kind of did it at the same time, but I wasn't even the first to be a goalie. Okay. My sister, my younger sister was in goal first, 
And I have a competition thing with all of my siblings and with everyone in the world <laughs> where I'm like, oh, I can do that. So I got into the goal, not realizing that no one wants to be a goalie. Oh, and that's it just stuck, you know? I had a lot of fun with it. It's one of the most challenging parts of water polo, like being the goalkeeper carrying that keeper carrying that pressure and just making blocks, but it's the most fun too. Yeah. In my makes opinion. Sense. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. As long as you're enjoying it, like you said, yeah. like people, it's the same kind of in soccer. I feel like I actually played goalie um, or keeper when I was like U10 and I would play oh. half, half the game and goal and then the other half on the field. And eventually it was like, okay, I actually just want to go play. Cause I would in soccer. It's not, I feel like it's not as um, if your team's good, you're not really probably getting as many shots as you do in water polo. It feels yeah, bigger. You're waiting you know? ar- around a lot. Yeah. I think there's a lot of flower picking for me. Going yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I'll go, I'll go out and play in the field. But um, I did that thing where I played both for a while too. And when I play like masters now, I still try to do a little bit of field, a little bit of goal, but you have to, I'm, and it's the same in soccer. You run a lot more, Yeah. but you have to swim a lot more. And I'm like, whoo. <laughs> I'll just stand the goal goal. back here. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Hang out for a bit. Oh, man. So what was the um, what was the scene like in Miami for water polo? Was it like if I grew up in Georgia, there was no water polo. My first introduction to water polo was when I got to Stanford and watched the team there and saw them practice and play. So what was that? So was it kind of I mean, obviously was available. Um, So was it was it big? Was it popular? Yeah, so if you look at the landscape of water polo across the U.S., it's pretty much in every state there's like two or three places where water polo is. It's like alive and rampant, and those three places compete against each other over and over until everyone goes to California to compete in like Junior Olympics, which isn't like the Olympics, but it's a huge tournament that USA Water Polo organizes so that everyone faces some competition from across the states. But in Florida, it was one of those places where there are three major teams in in Miami. And then later it's been spreading through Florida, but three major teams that you just played all the time. So not very developed, not very well known. Everyone, I had to explain how you get the horses in the water to everyone that I told play, (laughs) I played water polo. What does that even um, mean? Get the horses in the water. So everyone is like, they know what polo is and that there's horses. And they're like, how do you get horses in the water? Oh my That's God. like the joke everyone makes <laughs> when they that hear about water polo. Went right over my head. That's so yeah. funny. <laughs> but once oh, I, yeah. like, as I grow, I know that water polo is like 10 times bigger in California. Everyone knows what it is, especially in Southern California. And um, I mean, the narrative is changing now, but... Being a part of this team, I'm the first African-American woman to compete on the Olympic stage in water polo for the U.S. So that's a huge, a huge thing that I carry with me. But it's also representative of how um, much more water polo has to grow across the state. And it's not just race based, even though that's a big part of aquatics in general. It's just water polo across the board. needs more <laughs> needs more popularity needs to be known by more people because it's a s- super fun very dynamic sport i'm sure you cheered on your men's and women's teams while you're yeah. at um, stanford i love watching waterfall i think it's such an exciting sport to watch and i can't i can't imagine playing it because i would probably drown but um <laughs> and it's like so intense and so cutthroat and aggressive but i i completely agree i think um any like i mean not any sport is great for people to get into and the accessibility is honestly the piece that a lot of times holds people out of it and like you said water polo it sounds like I mean it is the case when it comes to the fact that there's like the little hot spots and not everyone has access to it so yeah hopefully moving forward it will be because I do think it's like such a fun sport to watch and I feel like more kids would benefit from being part of it so growing up you obviously swam water polo did you play any other sports so I no no (laughs) really yeah I just played I just swam and I played water polo and that's kind of like it was really easy for my mom to take us all to practice there are five kids true she's just like dropped us off at the pool we all went to the same school for elementary school middle school so it just was the easiest um option and then when we got to high school she was kind of we split up across schools and she was doing this 
drop off route all around Miami. Oh no. Where um she would literally start at like five and then end at seven and then start again in the eve in the afternoon pickups when school was over. So once we found people who went to our schools who were also going to practice, it was a lot easier for my mom. But having us all in the same sport was like the path of least resistance. Yeah. And it it worked out. Like we got a lot of great benefits from water polo and from swimming, but yeah, if people are always surprised to hear that I didn't do more sports, but it just wasn't that feasible. Yeah, that makes sense. My mom, um, I've talked about this before, but my mom put, I tried out, I'm a year, 16 months younger than my older sister. And my mom, when I, we both tried out for club soccer, I was going to be on the U9 team and she was going to be on the U10 team. And she told the coach, she was like, no, they're both on the same team. I'm not driving them to different practices, different times, different places. So I totally get that. And your mom did it for five kids, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I can't imagine doing that. So shout out, shout out to your mom for being able shout to pull it off. Moms. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mom's everywhere. Um, so, okay. So you only did water polo, a little bit of swimming, but you got water polo as the bonus. And in high school, you were a four-year letter winner and starter on your team's, con- like, three consecutive Florida State championships. So you guys were, like, pretty good. Yeah, we were good. I It's so funny to, like, look back and, um, like, hear those things listed because in my perspective as a young athlete, I was never, like, focused on um, – any championship as the big ending point you know it was like really? every game every practice was like just fun yeah and I know like a lot of other athletes within my teams like got super nervous felt a lot of pressure from these big moments and I credit my mom to to a lot of the diffusion of that pressure for me and for my family in general I know we all approach sports this way this way but like every time we got to get in the water was an opportunity like if she had time to take us to practice if we had the opportunity to play water polo like it wasn't swimming (laughs) we were gonna (laughs) we were gonna take full advantage and um yeah just one thing led to another you know it wasn't like anyone built up high school season too much anyone built up club season too much it was all Like there was no, I never had an Olympic dream when I was younger. I wasn't like trying to get anywhere with sport and I didn't even know where sport could take me. So Mm -hmm. all of that pressure was kind of um, diffused. Like I, of course I absorbed it from my teammates. Like if they had that from somewhere or they had this goal, huge goal in their mind, but I was always like, I'm just going to go with the flow. And if you ask my teammates, if you ask Maggie, uh, she was on the podcast earlier, but (laughs) she's like, Ashley has such a go-with-the-flow mentality in sports, and um, that's where it comes from, you know? Like, the way our mom kind of guided us through sport. Like, she didn't play sports really growing up. She didn't really have the understanding of how American sports could go, so she was like, this is your playtime. Like, Yeah, totally. Go. <laughs> that's incredible to hear, like, all the things you've accomplished, and to you, it seems like even now... It, and I might be projecting or assuming that like it's just you know you're you're enjoying it. It's an opportunity to play as opposed to like, oh, I like want to get you know achieve this, this, and this. I'm here to do X, Y, and Z. You know, like I feel like most athletes that make it to the very top, like you have done, are much more probably type A. Like, do do you consider yeah. yourself that way? Or are you more no? no? <laughs> you're like nah. No, I get like. Yeah, when you say it, it's so I'm funny. Like, no, like hard boxes. No, like you know. But I like that. Though. I I do feel like I'm becoming more like that because there are so many possibilities in the world, and I had a lot of cool and really um, driven people who were guiding me when I was younger and could see my potential before I saw it or saw the opportunities um, as they came and were like able to guide me and able to advise me and um, people I trusted so I listened so that was really cool but now I know that that power is in my hands and it's always really been in my hands but now I see the possibilities and now I see how I can help others um, pursue the pathways that I've 
I've been able to pursue, get the opportunities that I've gotten, but also um, help them explore new pathways, you know, like trailblaze in their own right and do whatever they want. And I, I have the power to help with whatever they want to do. So it's cool to have gone through the process and not had that pressure and now be able to utilize that pressure or to welcome the responsibility of representation and to welcome um, the opportunities that come and be able to see everything and actively choose where I'm going. Totally. That's awesome. I love that. As an athlete and a footballer, data has helped me elevate my game. Whether it's tracking my GPS during a game or training, monitoring my heart rate during workouts, recording my top speed throughout speed sessions, and even making sure I am properly recovering, data has allowed me to customize my training and ultimately get me to the next level. It has truly been a defining factor in my approach to my training and my performance. Our good friends at WIS also love data. They provide services that blend tech and accounting to help businesses get the data they need to track performance. WIS is the coach that comes alongside you, reviews your financials, and identifies the technology you need to get the business results you want. WIS is good with numbers, epic with people. So you weren't, you didn't think Olympics, you weren't like, oh, I, you know, want to be the best goalkeeper in the world in water polo. So at what point during your high school career did you think like, oh, I have the potential, and I'm not even going to say go to the Olympics, just to play in, play in college because... You went, I mean, you ended up at Princeton, which is an incredible school, really good water polo school. So talk about high school in that regard of like, when do you think you started to take it more seriously, if you did? And then also, what did that recruiting process look like for you? So in high school, um, like I said, I was kind of playing day by day. I knew I was going to go to college. That was one thing that my mom kind of drilled into us education is the most important thing so whether or not it was with water polo I was going to go to college and that's what my that's why I worked hard in high school that's why I did all the things that I did in preparation of going to college but when I realized that I could also play in college um, I still decided to prioritize academics and prioritize balance in my life and the same thing with um, how water polo is more like more the norm in California, it's the same thing with the spread of colleges. So Princeton isn't a typical water polo school. Yeah. So I chose Princeton because I wanted that balance. I wanted to be able to prioritize myself as a student and also as a person before a water polo player. And I knew with the recruitment process, like I was looking at a lot of top schools. I was looking at um, USC, uh, Michigan. I was looking at a lot of really great schools for water polo and for academics, but I knew from what the people on the team were telling me, what the coaches were telling me, they were really prioritizing me as an athlete rather than a student. And um, it was really important that I get that balance. And when I went to Princeton, it was like super low key in terms of water polo, like how the coach was even recruiting me. Like he didn't really know who I was, which was <laughs> like should have been a red flag ish. But yeah, <laughs> like most athletes would be like, no, and you're like, yeah, this is great. I'm like, you don't know. <laughs> Perfect. But no, he didn't really like. He wasn't like saying this, this, and this is how you're going to get to the Olympic Games. He was like, so tell me about yourself. Aww. And I was like, that's cool, you know. And one of my best friends was already going there, someone who I grew up playing with in Miami, Ashley Hatcher. So I was like, show me what life is like here. And she like, it wasn't like all parties. It wasn't like all like she wasn't like so stressed out about academics and stuff. Like she had found a really good balance and was introducing me to her friends and we played volleyball in the quad. It was just a really fun, like fall experience. So I was yeah. like, yeah, I could do this. <laughs> this would be really cool. And of course, like Princeton's reputation precedes itself. And um, I was sold on that too, but it was, it was just a really cool um, example of how I might find that balance in my life with academics and water polo and just being a person, being a student in an academic environment. Yeah, makes sense. And I, I agree. I, I kind of took the same um, approach in that my dad told me, go, I guess both my parents said, you know, 
pick a school that if soccer was no longer in the equation, you would want to be a student there. And it yeah. sounds like that was kind of how you approached it. Um, but I must say Miami to Princeton is a pretty big jump. So how did you handle the winters there? I'm very curious. Yeah, so we went, me and my mom and sister went to the Burlington Coat Factory. <laughs> oh, nice. Very smart. And we got like the the thickest coat that Miami sold, oh, which no. is nowhere <laughs> what you, you needed for winter. <laughs> yeah, you probably had never owned a winter coat. I never had. And yeah. didn't have boots, didn't have rain boots. I thought rain boots was like a fashion item. <laughs> It rains all the time in Miami and everyone just wears flip flops. Yeah. But when it's cold rain, you have to like wear those thick, those thick like socks on top of socks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I had to learn a lot. It was a huge <laughs> learning curve going and like seeing what winter was actually like and just experiencing the seasons. But that's another part of why I chose going to the Northeast. Like I wanted to see fall. I wanted to experience spring and winter and I knew I wouldn't have to like be shoveling snow. <laughs> so I was like, this is gonna be chill. Like, <laughs> it's gonna be cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Princeton's a beautiful campus too. So I totally get what you saw on that. Um, at what, like, what year did you commit to Princeton? I'm, just because in so many, the sports, it just differs in terms of like when people actually commit. Some soccer players commit as early as sophomore year. So when, when did you make that commitment? Yeah, I actually committed the end of my junior year. Okay, so not too Which early. is late for other sports, but yeah. that's where water polo was at the time. I think it's um, a lot earlier now. Yeah. And with Princeton, you have to apply regularly. Yeah. I mean, early decision, but yeah, you apply regularly. Like So, yeah. and when did you, so did you commit and then find out that you got in as a student? Yes, I did. You did? Oh, yeah, I man. did. <laughs> uh, when did you find out that you got in as a student? Was it like early fall of your senior year? Yes, it was. It okay. was. Yeah. And I was like, it was so exciting. Like, it was so exciting to share that with my family, like to share that with uh, my teammates and my friends at school. It was, it was cool. I love watching. This is one thing about me. Like, I watch Soldiers Coming Home on YouTube and I okay. watch college decisions oh like those it makes me cry so much that is like, i always watch it that is like one of the most amazing things i've i've heard on this podcast it's like that's what you watch on youtube which is yeah. like talk about just like an immediate mood booster you know yeah oh that's it's so just cute like instant joy did you have did you do like a signing day yes i did okay yeah very cool very cool i recently went back to my high school and it just gave me such huge perspective in how lucky I was. And my sister went to the same high school and the same college in our past. Like we went to Ransom Everglades School in Miami. Um, people from Miami will know what it is, but it's a private school. It's application based and we receive scholarships to go there. So it was a 50 minute commute from my house. Dang. But like the amount of investment that the people in the community of Ransom Everglades and Ransom Everglades puts into their students, it's absolutely incredible. I went back there to just like hang out with the water polo team and they built a whole new STEM center. Wow. I was just like, wow, <laughs> we went here. Yeah. Like, it's just crazy. Like looking back on, on the journey and just being so grateful for what we've gotten. You yeah. Know? Totally. I agree. It's important to, to look back and yeah, see how far you've come. It's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So in college, you go to Princeton, you, you hopefully find a, the correct uh, thickness of a coat. And you also <laughs> made, I guess, the move into being a goalkeeper. So were, you kind of talked about this earlier. You played out. At, do you call it like in the field? Like, what do you say? Okay. Yeah. Okay. You, play, you played in the field, but also keeper in high school. But then in college, is that when goalkeeper became your, um, like, your number one position? Yeah, goalkeeper was pretty solid in college. And then moving into the national team, just goalkeeper. Nice. The level just got to the point where I was like, if I'm not swimming, I'm not going to be able to compete. And it, it was just <laughs> better for me to be in yeah. the goal. And it was, it was cool because, like I said, I chose Princeton for the balance of it. And 
I was always able to take the classes that I wanted. We practiced um, early morning before before school, um, in the mid afternoon after classes, and you kind of got to adjust your schedule or adjust your practice schedule, like move lifts mm. around if it conflicted with class, which was really cool. Um, the Ivy League has limitations on practicing in the fall, so learning just learning the like how things go and managing your time as a student athlete i feel really lucky because i i started to learn that time management um in high school and then it just paid off in spades getting into that getting right into that environment in college yeah, makes sense and it does sound like princeton really prioritized the education piece for their student athletes in the sense of like you can move things around make things work you were able to take all the classes you wanted to you didn't have to you know major in something you didn't want to because it was the only option in terms of like what worked with practice I feel like that's happens happens I feel like it happens like with football players a lot but um yeah but what did you end up majoring in I'm curious I majored in psychology oh very cool amazing did you know you wanted to do that Mm -hmm. before you got there I didn't. I actually went in thinking I was going to be okay. pre-med. I'm not great at science or math. or <laughs> Really? <laughs> Titrations got me, yeah. I feel like that's a type A personality trait, you know? Like, very specific. Yeah. <laughs> very specific. I was like, like I can't bake. I love to that's cook. so funny. But I can't bake because I'm like, a little bit of this. And it's like, that's no. That's so funny. <laughs> I, love, I love to cook, but I love to bake more. And I'm a science math yeah. brain. That is, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, it's all very yeah. specific, and I'm like, I need to have a little bit of spice. You <laughs> yeah, <know>? exactly. <laughs> Don't put you in a box. Don't put you in a box. Don't put me yeah. in a box. Oh, man, that's incredible. All right, well, at Princeton, um, you're the all-time career saves leader, which is pretty incredible. Did you think, I mean, even just talking to you now, that wasn't something even on your mind when you went in there? <laughs> no. No, you were it just wasn't. Saving it really and- wasn't. Leading. Yeah, and it was cool because going to a school where, um, like like Princeton, that's not a California school. I had a really good group that I went yeah. in with, a really good um, incoming class. And you go there knowing that you're if you put in the work, you can be a leader pretty early in your career. And I also had a really good grade right above me, so they challenged me to step up and. Um, play my role on the team you know be a great goalkeeper like block the ball (laughs) so that's really cool but I also felt supported by the coaching staff and by my teammates so I just I feel like I came in at a really good time to um, have space to explore to take risks and also to just like play without the pressure of having to be a certain way having to do um, everything or not being able to do anything You know, I, I feel like I got some good time and some good coaching and just great support from my teammates and uh, with yeah, training. Yeah, makes sense. You also compiled 100 career victories while you were at Princeton. So, and that's like, that's a lot for, you know, you, you play four years. I don't know how many games you guys have in a season, but how have you seen that growth of the Princeton's the Princeton program and water polo since you got on to where it is now? Like, has it continued to evolve and get better and and compete at, you know, with the California schools? Yeah, I think that it's an interesting growth pattern. I feel like water polo has these cycles. So some years it's really, really good, very competitive. Some years it's really low and kind of like a growth year. I feel like Princeton has been right on that track. I feel like right now it's in a building year and um, it's been really fun to watch the kind of the narrative of the program change from like you deprioritize pursuing water polo to like as your whole life, but you become more of a full Mm. person and that includes being an athlete. And I feel before you kind of had to neglect that side of you to be at Princeton to pursue academics. And as I was going there, it was changing. Like it was becoming more of an equal weight or you can choose the weight that you put in in any any arena at any time. Mm -hmm. And there's space to prioritize either. And I I feel that getting even closer to um, 
even closer to a balance so that athletes who choose Princeton aren't giving up on their ambitions to be a part of the national team or their ambitions to play abroad or professionally or eventually in a league when we start one in the U.S. Like, it's it's really cool to see that kind of growth and it's really fun to see... um, to hear athletes reaching out to me, it's reaching out to people who have gone to Ivy League or gone East Coast or Midwest and um, just exploring options in water polo past college, but also investing in their future past water yeah, polo. Yeah, totally. That's a great way to put it. I love that you just said it like that because that's I think that's like the most important reason that you have college athletics, you know, to be able yes. to be a full human. You can pursue both with equal passion and that that's in my mind that's like why college athletics should exist yeah you just you said I it much agree. better than i did today we're introducing you to wiss's very own amanda dominguez amanda is the chief operating officer at wiss and works closely with the wiss leadership team in delivering meaningful people strategies that support a high performance culture by attracting, developing, and retaining top caliber talent. Amanda believes that good leadership begins with a real relationship. On top of being highly accomplished and an expert in her field, she fosters environments of growth by constantly leading with a people-first mentality and investing in the success of those around her. If all that wasn't enough, Amanda is a mother to two wonderful daughters and wants to show them that there is no limit to what they're capable of. Amanda, it is women like you who continue to change the game. Join us next week for more stories of female leaders in business, in sport, and beyond. While you were at Princeton, you're playing for the national team. So when did you get onto the national team? Is it similar to soccer where it's like a youth youth teams and then those kind of funnel into the full team? So what did your national team journey and path look like to the full team? Yeah, so we have something called Olympic Development Program, which okay. I'm sure it's the same. ODP, yep. Yeah, the pipeline. So you're in it at the youth, junior, I'm sure there's one cadet. There's a lot of different levels at the bottom that yeah. feed into the senior national team. My, Me and my sister, we I always reference her because we have parallel journeys in water polo because we're always together. We're about 15 months apart, like oh, me and your cool. sister. Yeah. So we were in the um, pipeline for a while when we were younger, but it just got to be too expensive and it kind of didn't go anywhere in our minds. (laughs) So we stopped that um, early in high school. And then um, in the college system, our national team coaches and different coaches just watch and scout players through games, through seasons. And... My sophomore year, I got a call from the senior national team coach, Adam Krikorian, um, offering me the opportunity to train with the senior women's team with the potential to make the Olympic team. And he was like, there's no nothing here that's for certain. Like, it's going to be what you put into it that you get out, but here's the opportunity, you yeah. know? And it kind of really scared me because... I never saw myself there, you know, that was never my goal. Okay. And it was a group of women that I'd kind of looked up to and um, never really saw myself at their level. I never really imagined that I could be an Olympic water polo player, but I was like, love a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to, to try. And the worst that could happen was that I don't make it, but I still grow as an athlete. Like I learned from one of the best coaches in the world. I'm surrounded by all of these women who I've looked up to, like, it's going to be hard. Yeah. But what of this hasn't been hard, you know? That's so yeah. really cool. So, okay, so this was your this was your sophomore, junior year at Princeton. This was, yeah, between my sophomore and junior year. Okay, and that was, what year was that? That was in 2014. Okay, so is this, when you got that call, was it the first time that you thought, oh, I could maybe go to the Olympics? Yes. Really? I mean, people had really, like, said it in passing okay. as I went. But, like, those are just little seeds, you know? Totally. Like, and it matters where it's coming from. When yeah, somebody's parent too. says, <laughs> I'm like, well, what do you know about the national team? <laughs> it's yeah, so true, so though. That was the first time that I, like, I was like, okay. <laughs> 
And I'm one to only consider things real when mm-hmm. they're real. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. That is so interesting. Well, so you get this call and then in, this is in 2014. Yes. So you go, 2014, the FINA, FINA, do we call it FINA? Yeah, FINA. FINA World Cup. You make that team with the national team, full team. Yeah. And you're named player of the tournament at the 2014 Karishi Cup. Am I saying that right? Yeah. So you're <laughs> we named- We hit all the Ks yeah, that year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, went- yeah. Sorry, so you no, 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 no. What else did you guys go to? No, I don't I don't remember what else we went to that summer. That summer was really a blur. It was okay. my first summer with the national team. Like the biggest thing that stood out to me that summer was who I was rooming with. Okay. Like I was rooming with Cami Craig, Courtney Mathewson. Like okay. those are three time Olympians on um two time and three time Olympians on our women's Olympic team and it's like just awestruck, you know? And yeah. I'm playing alongside Maggie Steffens, Kylie Neuschel. Like, it was all of the people who were part of it that were more significant to me. Also, it was interesting to me that we were going to middle of nowhere Russia. We were, like, in Siberia, playing in front of no crowd (laughs) against random countries. Like, that was something that was completely new to me. So I was, like, what kind of just looking around for how to react to it, you know? That's like, crazy. Okay, we're on the plane. <laughs> this is like a nine hour, ten hour flight. Never yeah. done that. <laughs> yeah. So you so this is like your first time in with the full team and you make the you know, the the coach calls you. This is you think, Oh, I could maybe he he brings up the Olympics. You think, Oh, I could maybe go to the Olympics. This is the first time you're really thinking about it. And then you go to these tournaments, you're named player of the tournament at one of them, and then in the FINA World Cup, you're named the top goalkeeper. So, like, you go from literally thinking, not thinking about the Olympics, to now in a span of, I assume, a couple months or maybe even weeks, being touted as one of the best players on the team. So what was that like? (laughs) It's so interesting. So like I said at the beginning, our team is super humble, you know? So I got these accolades at the tournament, and then it was straight back to practice. Like, no one mentioned it, really. (laughs) We went straight back to practice. Yeah. And it really kind of shrunk the experience down in my mind in a good way. Mm. Like, it was like, that's just part of the journey. This is just how it happens. We're still working towards an Olympic Games. And part of our sport not getting a lot of coverage and, like, our sport not really making it past California. It's like, I didn't even know what FINA was, like what World Cups were, what World Championships were. I was like, okay, these are little like fun games that we play on the way (laughs) to the Olympics. You know, these are all part of it. But, and now I understand the gravity of those things. And like, I have a more um, full perspective of sports on the world stage, but Before then, I didn't even, I never imagined myself going to China, going to Russia to play against the top players in the world and what it meant to receive something like that, what it meant to be a part of a team like the team that I'm a part of. Like, that was something that I learned along the way, and I learned it in a very humble environment. So (laughs) even though we were getting those accolades, we were winning those tournaments, the ultimate goal in every quad that I've been a part of has been the Olympic Games, you know? So all of these things are preparation on the pathway to the Olympic Games, which is where we truly celebrate the wins and the victories. And, like, of course, we're like, great job. Like, like really, a nice pass means so much more than the goalkeeper of the tournament within the team, you know? Because who's really giving that? that recognition it's your teammate who's like you're making that connection you're making that that thing you've been working on you're you know yeah I, it's, I, it's really interesting how it builds yeah you understand totally being, totally it's like when because yeah it, i i completely get it and i love hearing you say that because it is it is like oh you get all these you know you might get all these this recognition but at the end of the day the ultimate goal is olympic gold for you guys so all these other things are just kind of 
not blips on the map. They mean something. But at the end of the day, the journey. They're part of the journey. Yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. And looking back as us individually, like those all make up the journey. And all of that is worth so much more than the physical gold medal. But it's like you need to kind of be focused and looking forward on the pathway. It's such an interesting balance because you don't want to miss what you're going through and you don't want to be consumed by the end. Absolutely. But you you kind of have to have a head down and grind kind of mindset sometimes. It is. Yeah. I think I, I think that about that a lot. The grind part of it where it's like exactly like you said, the the. The, all of those little things along the way are more than just like the weight of the medal or the significance of the medal that you receive. But at the same time, you can't get caught up in the little things along the way to not make it to the final you know, piece that you want, the final success, final victory. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, it's like, it truly is about the journey. Like the journey is what makes it worth it. You know, it's not just yeah. that one final game or that moment where you get a medal placed around your neck that is what feels so good it's the whole thing combined um i love that and i love thinking about it and i love talking with athletes about it because i think that everyone kind of sees it similarly but it's all it's different for individually for everybody yeah it's so cool to hear the different perspectives on the journey and like what each part of the journey means because like even looking at me and like someone else on my team who's type a who's had an olympic dream their whole life or maybe who their parent competed at the same level, like they know what each part of this means and it carries a different weight to them. And like, I've been learning as I've gone along yeah. and that's been a cool experience, but it's even cooler or cool in a different way to hear about someone who's like, this means so like every single piece of it is hugely significant in some way. And it might be completely different than why it's significant to me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so you end up making your first Olympic team in 2016. And can you talk about that in that it wasn't something you wanted as a kid? You weren't like never really focused on it. didn't even really think about it until you got that call. And then you, you end up making the first Olympics that you pretty much were available for. So what was that like? I mean, it was incredible. Once I decided that I wanted it, I really wanted it. Mm. And like I said, I'm super competitive. So it was like every single day we went to practice and it wasn't always easy. It it really was never easy. But it was <laughs> always uh, an opportunity to compete, to like show your best self and to work hard, to fail, and to do it against all of these people who wanted the same thing. And it was just... it's an interesting environment to be a part of it was really um wild to be a part of it in the last quad because there was an extra year so we were Mm. really in that most competitive most challenging part for two years straight yeah and um the balance of emotion and engagement and um just managing relationships that's one of the hardest parts in that environment because you're competing against at least two other people for the same spot and you're just also training with them and friends and you know like your friend group shrink shrinks down to your teammates because i i moved from miami to california to la to like pursue this dream to pursue this um making this team so I kind of had to build new roots and the only people who I, who I was around on a regular basis were my teammates and we were all exposed to the same stressors, going through the same experience, which is super growing, but it's also very challenging because there's no real decompress and it's, yeah. it's like a lot of, you want to complain a lot and that kind of builds up and you kind of, you just need some, um, you need like your own space sometimes. So. It's just a really challenging environment in positive and negative ways. But in the end, it was really, really amazing and really awesome to have worked to make this team and to see that uh, the time that you put in with your teammates, the time that you put into yourself and to your growth pay off. And um, 
it definitely paid off in the water yeah. both times in the yeah. connections that we all formed and the hard times that we went through together and made it past. Totally. I feel you on that. It's interesting hearing you talk because it's very similar to like the national team structure with soccer in that you're around your team all the time pretty much. You're competing against these people for a spot, but ultimately you want to, you know, like you want to be the best one, but then you want everyone else to be really, really good too because you all need, everyone needs to be at their best. So it's such an interesting dynamic um, getting to that final roster and and the journey that goes into it and the grind. I am interested to know, were you nervous before the gold medal match in 2016? This is your first Olympics. Up until this point, you've only won gold with Team USA in water polo. Did you feel pressure going to that match at that point in your career? Yes. And okay. I'm nervous before every game, though. <laughs> oh, you are. Okay, I'm one of good. those, yeah. And if I'm not nervous, it feels weird. It's like, I'm like, what do I need? I need to get nervous, you know? Yeah, totally. So, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I was it. I was definitely nervous. I'm one of the people who, like, dances before games, like, tries to get everyone engaged, you know? I, I'm a good type of nervous, you know? It feels productive. It feels like good energy, like a buzzing through the team. And yeah. I like to, like, share that with people. I think for it's sure. um, it's really productive for me. I know yeah. nervousness isn't always great for people, but I like it. And I was nervous before that that first match, the first time um, going for a gold with the team. It was it was really cool. And what did it feel like to have a medal and a gold one placed around your neck? I mean, that moment was indescribable. And I think the coolest part of it was for sure sharing it with my teammates, but also looking up into the stands and seeing my family there and like just them cheering for us, cheering for my team, like having heard secondhand about the work we've been putting in together, like all of the relationships and like everything that we've been through. And then just being there in the ultimate moment after having been through the whole journey with me personally, like behind me, consoling me, cheering for me, celebrating with me, it was really cool that they got that experience in person and um, that I was able to, like, see that, you know? Yeah, for sure. I get, like, I almost got a little emotional hearing you talk about looking up and seeing your family because I feel that for sure. I think it's one of the most special moments that can be had between, like, yeah. an athlete and their support system and the people that have been there the longest. So it's um, so special and so cool that you, you know, had that moment with them i'm curious about overseas so you've played for a number of clubs in greece and italy so what would you say your favorite part of playing overseas is my favorite part of playing overseas is getting to know the people that i'm playing against you Mm. know because like obviously the best people from every country are playing against us all the time on the world stage. So in when we're playing in the countries as just individuals, we get so much more of an opportunity to get to know like the best people at the personal level. And yeah. it just humanizes the whole game for me and makes the experience so much more deep in a way because if you only play with the national team and you only see the people who you're playing against like through a scouting report, it's yeah. always like they're kind of faceless names or numbers. That's and such a good way to put it. Yeah, it's like a really easy way to be like us versus them. And that's good to a certain point, like to a certain extent, but also like playing against and with them, you get to know who they are like they're your teammates, you know? And like, my teammates can beat me much easier than my opponents can beat me you know my teammates know me in a different way than my opponents know me and getting to know my opponents in that way and being teammates with them just like brought the game to a whole new level and it also extends past the game you know I respect the sport at a different level I respect their journeys at a different level because I know where they came from I know why they do what they do And I feel like knowing someone's why is just like a huge key to unlocking depth, you know, unlocking depth like across the board. So 
it's just really cool to make those connections. And I've made some of my best friends on other teams in my abroad experiences and connections and friendships that I hope will last through life. But it's just been a really cool experience, like broadening my perspective through those yeah. things. That's super special. And um, I totally agree with you. It's so interesting when you get to know a player as opposed to just like, you know, the name, you know, the face and like, you yeah. know, what they're, what, what their yeah, highlights are. You know, they want to do know? this. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, <laughs> I know like, you're, you're left why? Over, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's so true. It's so true. It really does humanize, um, you know, opponents and, and players that you wouldn't typically see as opposed to just like, I'm going to beat you. Um, yeah. Do you think, so there's no, there's no water polo league in the U.S., um, but do you think, you know, obviously NBSL has gained a lot of popularity over the last years. WNBA just celebrated their 25th anniversary. Do you think that there's a place or p- a potential for women's water polo to have a league in the U.S.? Like Athletes Unlimited is is opening these opportunities for softball, for volleyball. Um, I think an Athletes Unlimited water polo league would be sick. But what do you think about the potential there? So in my most optimistic version of myself, of course, I think that there's a lot of potential there. Personally, I've been wanting to find a pathway to explore a league within the U.S. And I know that there's so much talent at the college level that people just kind of pack up their suit and pack up the ball and go work like because they think they're supposed to. I my in my mind, I was like, maybe the next pathway is to opening is opening up more um, opportunities abroad. But if there were a league in the US, I would be the first to join it. Like that would be so amazing. And yeah, like we could play for so long, we could be excellent for so long and just um, continue to contribute the expertise that we've gained as athletes who have played since we were nine played since we were so young and are super passionate about this sport. And like people think that the only way to give back to the sport is through coaching, through like mentorship. All mm-hmm. of those things happen within a team. Yeah. So like if there was more opportunity to play longer and like use the time that we've put in to get to this level in our sports, like I know there are so many water polo players who would take full advantage of that and would be like so so excellent. Like they would excel in a league yeah. in the US. Like I'm hoping for the day if do you say athletes unlimited? Yeah, athletes unlimited. It's like a interest or new concept that they've kind of put together. It's it's kind of like an umbrella, I don't know, organization league. that's starting okay. these different leagues um for different sports and they've been doing a great job and it's like super fun to watch and they kind of do it in a different format um in a condensed schedule. So, yeah, it's pretty That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to explore that. Yeah, I, we'll put you guys in touch. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll have me. just women's sports people put you guys in touch. There you go. <laughs> uh, so, so 2020 Olympics, obviously COVID happens, um, not able to, to be held that year. They get pushed back a year. What was 2020 like for you? Were you... Uh, were you sad? Like, what was your feeling when the, you found out the Olympics were going to be postponed? Because I feel like there was a range of emotions from athletes when that happened. Yeah. Um, obviously, like, our team was ready to go. Yeah. Um, looking back now, though, we had a lot of poten- – we had a lot more work that we could put in. So, in a way, it was a blessing. But at the time, it just felt like a huge letdown, like a huge drop-off. Um, for our team, we kind of just shut down training immediately. Everyone went in their separate directions. We didn't even hear that the Olympic Games were postponed. We just heard that they were like we it was so uncertain. We didn't know if they were even going to happen. So once we were just kind of in this will they or won't they state for a long time. And that was really challenging because we had been peaking with our training for a while. And we were just at home. We didn't have, I didn't personally have access to a pool. So I was like, okay, what do I do? Uh, like, I you was. You were just like this? Yeah. At home land, like, you know? Just holding a ball, like. <laughs> Pretending and, like you're treading water. I'm like. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know if, like, we were gonna, um, 
like, should I stay in shape? What should I do? The direction that our team was giving us was like the best that we had, but it wasn't very good direction. So <laughs> at a certain point, I was just like, okay, I'm too stressed out of, about this. Like, I don't like to be stressed. I was I about can't. to say, you stressed out? <laughs> Me? Yeah that's, yeah, that's a problem. You had a problem. I was problem. like looking around, I was like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was too stressed out. I was like, okay, if I'm going to train right now, I don't have a pool. I'm going to make this fun. So I like tried everything. I was like biking. I was doing some yoga i brought meditation into my practice i was doing like tennis ball stuff i started following this uh handball player a goalkeeper um who was doing all of these reaction drills at home so i started doing those drills and trying different things and just made it fun for myself and then like as we got more information we started doing team meetings like over zoom like everyone did and um we were doing that kind of mental engagement with our team social stuff but um i started just like getting back to what i like to do like i made my space like a zen space i lit candles i set up a corner that i would read in i you de-stressed yeah i i i you got back to normal actually yeah (laughs) Yeah. i got back to level me and (laughs) um just got to be good with myself and be good in my own space and be okay with the uncertainty because like I've always been good with flux and stuff but being in this environment where there is so much certainty and kind of so little room for the like the exploration of yourself I got really comfortable not doing that so when I had the space to do it I was just like uh what do i do and you know like when we get breaks it's kind of just like i'm not doing anything like our longest break is maybe a week so i just like lay on the couch (laughs) exactly i know it's wild yeah so now i realize that i don't need to do that you know that's not the best way for me to relax that's not the best way for me to unwind yeah like i've been able to rework my relationship with exercise, my relationship with eating, my relationship with even reading for pleasure and just do stuff that are, that feel good for me and aren't just like the extremes of it because I can. Totally. So yeah, that was, that was something positive that came out of the, the lockdown for me. Yeah. But it was an interesting, yeah, it was an interesting thing to deal with. Um, because being a part of a team, you kind of deal with things together, but we're kind of all cut out, cut off from each other. Like we just went back to our homes. I didn't go back to Florida cause I was like scared to fly, but I was in my house and I was like, what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> yeah. I feel like yeah. it gave a lot of people time to figure, to, to kind of figure out themselves. Like, like you said, we're constantly, training practicing games all that stuff on someone else's schedule and when we actually yeah. had I, me personally and it sounds like you too had the time to just be like well what do i like to do like what is the best uh routine for me that sort of thing i thought it was i mean it was obviously a terrible time for so many reasons but for me i found a lot of growth in it and really enjoyed the pause um yeah i'm glad to hear that and i'm yeah. glad to hear that for any athlete because totally it's really that we operate in these like very opposite ends of the spectrum yeah in the extremes and that's not a healthy way to live and that's it's not setting you up well to transition out of sport it's not setting you up well to be like a regular person who lives an athletic life like I'm like what do I do I step into a gym and I'm like what do I do (laughs) (laughs) what what do I yeah it's so (laughs) true oh. oh my gosh well, you were able to de-stress, but then get back and be the best Ashley in the water, in front of the goal. You guys win again in Tokyo. Um, in, in the gold medal game, you won 14 to 5. Is that right? Against Spain, which is just yeah. like ridiculous. I remember watching some of that and being like, oh, this is like a given. They're going to win. You know, like, thank God it wasn't stressful. Um <laughs> So for you, what was it like to get number two, like gold medal number two? I mean, it was awesome. It was especially cool having gone through lockdown, pandemic, 
experience this collective like this collective event with the world and then come yeah. back and just show the world that we can rebound that we're resilient that we are willing to put in the work you know we're willing to get back to where we were and it was it was really hard because we had no games <laughs> almost yeah. no games leading up until I know I remember talking we to Maggie about that yeah that crazy. we weren't traveling it was just so weird to have such an atypical journey and such kind of like a tumultuous game we lost a game I know the in the beginning yeah and I kind of felt like our coach was was pushing us to feel some adversity because you usually feel these ups and downs throughout the throughout the Olympic journey and yeah. we just didn't get that the only kind of training and the only kind of challenge was against ourselves and it just was hard to replicate what it would feel like being in a real game. So I think it was really positive that we lost in that game to Hungary. And it was kind of like just a wake up call. Like these teams are here to win. We need yeah. to bring our best. And from that moment, I felt like we were playing tentatively starting the tournament, even myself included as someone who came back as a veteran. So I was like, okay, something needs to change. We need to pick it up and I'm glad that happened because we did. We turned, flipped the switch, and um, we just head down like we need to get to the end, you know? Yeah. And that game, the score just showed that um, if you could have been in that tent with us in Spain before we go in for presentation, it was just like our energy was like, <laughs> get ready. There's something yeah. coming. Oh, that's amazing. I love to hear that. And it's incredible. I mean, the fact that you have only won gold ever for this team is in any tournament is insane. Um, and <laughs> it's been such a joy to talk to you today and just hear your perspective and your outlook and how you approach life and the game and sports. And um, so I'm really thankful for the time. We have a couple repeat questions that we do just real fast. Knock them out. Okay. If I wasn't playing water polo, I would be... If I wasn't playing water polo, I would be software programming. I would be in really? crypto. <laughs> cool. Do you know how to code? I don't, but I want to learn. I just you should. Like, I know. I'm just going to get onto Udemy and just like... You got to do it. Come on. Yeah. You can do it in your free time. Yeah, yeah. That's that's like a cool thing to pick up. Very useful. I like that. That's a that's first for that answer. Um how do you take your coffee? I take my coffee mostly milk with a drop of coffee. No way. Yeah, oat milk <laughs> with okay. a drop of coffee. Like I just like the taste of coffee, but that I can't is... drink a full. <laughs> that is hilarious. Oh man, that's good. I take my coffee black and I like drink espresso <laughs> drinks. And so we are on the other. opposite. <laughs> yes, different sides of the spectrum there. Um, okay, who's been the one person in your life that's always kept you moving? The one person in my life who's always kept me moving is my mom. When I was younger, yeah. she was always, like, pushing me. And now she's like, I'm like, come on, let's go. <laughs> Get him. We're going. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah. So totally. it's it's been fun watching our relationship evolve. I love that. Shout out to mom. She seems amazing. Um, all right. They say work hard, get lucky. How much of your success is predicated on luck? I feel like. 50% of it. <laughs> nice. All right. Yeah. It's it's just like p hard to imagine a reality where um, most of this isn't luck. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. It is kind of like life. It's like, why does this happen? How did I get here? Exactly. Is, and there are not a yeah. lot of answers to any of that. So I'm yeah. like, thank you to whoever did that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 50-50. Love it. Okay. Last question, Ashley. You've accomplished so much already. Where do you want to go next, and how do you keep pushing? Um, so my next immediate thing is playing in Greece for a cool. season, and hopefully Paris 2024. Nice. And I keep pushing, just... I keep on evolving as an athlete, and every time I change, I realize that I have so much more to go, so many more places that I want to go, and that potential and the possibilities is really what keeps me going. It's really such a driver, such a motivator, and it's really cool. Like, I'm like, what else is gonna happen? This is cool, like, it's my favorite show. <laughs> what else What else is luck gonna throw my way? Yeah, that's awesome. 
I love it. I love it. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for the time. You are like the brightest light and the happiest smile and just (laughs) a fantastic personality and a killer in the water. So um, thank you for the time today. This has been really wonderful. Thank you so much, Kelly. It was really great talking to you. You have amazing questions. You do your research. It's so fun. JWS, shout out to them. (laughs) They, They help out a lot. So, but yeah, thank you. To succeed, you can't do it alone. You need a team that understands you and your business on a personal level. And WIS takes that approach to help you win. Think less calculators, more conversations. WIS is a proud supporter of this podcast and the JWS community. To discover how WIS is more than just an accounting firm, visit wiss.com slash JWS. That's W-I-S-S dot com slash JWS.